Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambo channel. Avoid XRP. This is the message from a very popular YouTuber named Andre Jick. And um, uh, he's got 1,580,000 subscribers. And um, I've actually seen his channel before, so I was familiar with him. And I, I think he's, he's done a fine job in, in general, just from what I had seen from him. I've seen a handful of his videos. And th his most recent video is titled, Avoid This Cryptocurrency. And there's a picture of him holding up a coin with the Ripple logo on it. Which really, frankly, already right there raises some questions because uh, Ripple is a company. XRP is a cryptocurrency, a coin. So really, that should be a coin with XRP on it, not Ripple, right? <laughs> but uh, anyway, this video, which he put out yesterday, already has, as, as, at the time I record this, 219,000 views. So here's, here's the thing. I don't have a problem with people that... Um, feel differently than me about really just about anything in life, whether it's politics or religion or cryptocurrencies. Not at all a problem if somebody uh, doesn't like Ripple and XRP. But the concern that I have is he put out, a, he stated a bunch of things as facts that absolutely were not facts. And um, towards the later part of the video, he did say, look, uh, j just, just so you know, this is, and I'm paraphrasing here, but just so you know, this is only my opinion, uh, one guy's opinion here. But the thing is, he then stated a bunch of things as fact that were not fact. And so, you know, it's okay if we're both confronted with the same facts, factual data, and then we come to different conclusions, believe different things. That would be fine. But we've got to be grounded in reality. And so um, what I'm going to do is, is a response to this video and, uh, and, and break everything down. I actually, I've watched his video in its entirety twice now. The second time I took notes and I've got 18 bullet points I'm going to go through with you in this video. Um, so I don't know, this might be a longer video. I don't know how long it's going to take. Probably longer than his because there are some complex ideas that need to be described here. Um, and I do want to be clear at the outset. This is not an attack on Andre Jick. Uh, I am not trying to be rude at all, and I, I just want to be super duper clear. I enjoy thoughtful discourse, and diversity of thought is super duper fun. And so what I'm going to do here is just try and set the record straight with facts plus the way that I feel about uh, what's going on with Ripple and, and XRP specifically. But, um, you know, it, I, I don't want to have to dance around terms. That's why I'm going to cite, I'm, I am citing at the outset here that um, there is no intent on my part to to be rude. So if I sound blunt at any point during this, and I don't know if I will come across as that, uh, just know, please, at the outset, there's no intent to, to be rude here. Um, and, and so uh, let's go ahead and jump in. So the, uh, the first bullet point I had, had uh, noted here, was, uh, sorry, one sec here. Uh, there's a quote here. Ripple is a project worth $43 billion in terms of market cap. Um, and, and that's just not true. XRP is a cryptocurrency with a $43 billion, uh, $43 billion in terms of market cap. At the time he recorded it, uh, it's now $39 billion. At the time I record this, the market's been down a little bit today. Um, so Ripple's actually worth $10 billion. Ripple, the company, is that was the most recent publicly announced valuation. But uh, but no, XRP, uh, XRP itself, as I record this, is actually worth, you know, again, uh, 30, now it's 30, a little over $39 billion. Uh, now, he correctly points out, though, that XRP is technologically superior, citing transaction times and cost per transaction, also environmentally friendly. Uh, all of that stuff is true. Uh, now, he cited Ripple's technology is called XCurrent, but uh, apparently didn't realize that's actually no longer true. Ripple created payments, te uh, payments technology uh, called XCurrent. It was just, it's just a, a messaging system. And then they had a separate software that used to be called XRapid, and that was the, the portion that's designed to utilize XRP specifically for settlement. But now the messaging portion XCurrent is known as RippleNet, and the settlement portion, which is separate, is known as on-demand liquidity. And, and you'll see as I go through this video, one of the key things that he, he, he just, I, I, I legitimately don't think he understands, is the difference between payment and settlement. And that is, understanding that is core to understanding XRP's use case. And that is a huge part of what he's functionally miss, missing. So I will flesh that out as we go through this. Um, next, uh, let's see... 
Uh, he stated that XRP is Ripple's proprietary token. Uh, yeah, th this is not true. And so XRP was actually created before Ripple, the company, was, was created. And uh, Ripple doesn't own XRP it, like, itself. The like, like the XRP ledger, Ripple does not own it. Ripple has no special permissions over the ledger. Um, XRP uh, and the XRP ledger fully decentralized, arguably more decentralized than, than Bitcoin because since there's no mining, um, I mean, there's no opportunity for 51% attacks. Uh, mining collusion, not a thing within the XRP ledger. Um, next, uh, let's see, stated that Swift is unidirectional, uh, but actually that's that's really not true. And and so um, if, if I'm wrong in any capacity, feel free to correct me at all in the comment section below. Um, but my understanding is that Swift is not at all any, any longer unidirectional. Swift upgraded to what is known as Swift GPI, which is actually uh, bi-directional. And, and what, actually, you know, what, what was the catalyst for them improving their technology after almost 50 years of doing effectively nothing, doing the same thing, uh, was that they saw there was competition from Ripple. And so Ripple came out with their, their payments technology at the time known as XCurrent, now known as RippleNet. And, uh, and he is correct that uh, unidirectional messaging is a problem because just think... It's kind of like sending out a letter through the mail. You you, you know give it to the, the your your post person, post office, uh, or, or so your postman takes it out there. You hope it gets to uh, the intended recipient, but you you don't know for sure. And uh, and so bi-directional messaging fixed that on Ripple's platform specifically, but uh, Swift actually has updated with Swift GPI. And if, if if Swift GPI is not fully implemented, then it is the case that there actually is still some unidirectional. Uh, action going on there. So it could be the case. That's why I just wanted to be clear. I don't want to put out, pretend to know that something's fact if I'm not 100% sure about it. Uh, next, I uh, stated that XRP was created to provide liquidity to banks. Uh, while Ripple is positioning XRP to be used to solve a liquidity problem uh, regarding Nostra Vosha accounts, XRP was not created for this purpose, actually. And so it, it's actually, uh, it was David Schwartz, who is actually currently Ripple CTO, so David Schwartz, Arthur Brito, and Jed McCaleb. Those are the three people that created XRP. And actually, when they created it, all they were trying to do was create a better version of Bitcoin. And so they were early Bitcoiners, loved the Bitcoin technology, but they understood that with the nature of proof of work mining that they were gonna run into some te technological problems at scale, which have come to fruition to today. And they're only gonna get worse if they're not how somehow solved in the future. And so they just wanted to create a better version of, of XRP. And David Schwartz has publicly stated, look, we maybe vaguely had some sort of idea that it might somehow be used for payments in some sort of way, uh, in, in the payment process, at least in some sort of way. But they didn't really know. And so it wasn't created specifically for banks. It was just created as a decentralized uh, cryptocurrency. And then anybody can come along, since it's uh, it's permissionless, anybody can come along, and others have, and you can build on top of the XRP ledger, and you can utilize XRP for anything you want, just like you can utilize Bitcoin for anything you want. There is literally nobody to stop you, period. Um, and then he cited that uh, XRP was created so that uh, banks can, quote, open pre-funded channels, interact with this money, and then settle on Ripple's proprietary blockchain. Uh, that th end quote. So that, that's an actual quote from him. I transcribed it. And that is, uh, I don't, again, not trying to be real. Like, that is gibberish, actually. Um, again, the quote is, the banks can, quote, open pre-funded channels, uh, interact with this money. So this money he's citing XRP as money in the sentence and then settle on Ripple's proprietary blockchain. That's actually not how this works at all. So pre-funded uh, like pre bank accounts, that's what we're trying to get away from with XRP. That's what you can get away from with XRP. And so understand that the fundamental problem is that, and one of the many fundamental problems, is that you have locked up uh, just dormant capital uh, between banks that have relationships with one another. Uh, and you have to build trust in order to have a relationship with a bank, and they're actually hard to develop uh, from one bank to another. You, have, you, you do store money with, with each other effectively. Uh, it's the Nostra Vostro relationship. And so uh, that re means that 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 capital has to be available just in case it needs to be tapped into for liquidity, right? And so with XRP, the attempt is to get away from that because here's the thing. XRP, it's already being traded on cryptocurrency exchanges. People are already just speculating. So Ripple came along, and this is the genius of it. They came along and were like, huh. People are already trading XRP. Well, how about that? That's liquidity. People buying and selling XRP, that represents liquidity. So since it's already already available for sale on exchanges, why don't we just tap into that 
and then use XRP as a bridge. And so functionally how this works, and this is just one small example, and this is an actual corridor that's open in the United States to Mexico. You have a cryptocurrency exchange Bitstamp, which is officially partnered with Ripple. And so if you're a remittance firm or a bank, you can, and this is all automated by the way, as I'm describing this, you can open up a bank account. I'm sorry, not open bank account. You can uh, go ahead and uh, purchase XRP uh, on a cryptocurrency exchange. And if you're a remittance firm or a bank, then uh, that that XRP on that exchange on Bitstamp in the United States is then sh zipped over to a, a cryptocurrency exchange in Mexico called Bitso, which is officially partnered with Ripple. And then from there, that can go that that can uh, be sold into the Mexican peso, and then that can be converted to a remittance company or a bank. So that that's functionally how it works. No pre-funding needed. And so the fact that people are already buying and selling XRP on exchanges what makes this possible. This is the only solution that humans have devised to the dormant capital problem. There is no other solution that humans have devised, period. And XRP is the only cryptocurrency being positioned for this use case, period. Now, to me, that represents value because that's an actual problem uh, that's that's being solved right here today, all right? Um, next, uh, here we go. Uh, yeah, okay. he cited that XRP was created to uh, benefit banks and stated the following, quote, it gives them a standard where they don't have to worry about foreign exchange rates. That was the idea. So look, again, XRP, no, XRP was not created to benefit banks. It was just created to be a better version of Bitcoin. And to be honest, the creators of XRP did not know how it was going to be used. Maybe something for payments loosely, but Ripple didn't even exist when they created it. Uh, so no idea. And so as far as... Uh, you know, was what, he, what he stated here is that they, they don't have to worry about, banks don't have to worry about foreign exchange rates as a result of the utilization of XRP. Um, actually, that's not, not quite true. There are still going to be exchange rates. You can think about XRP, as I just described it a minute ago, being used as a bridge currency, and you have to buy it and sell it on exchanges. Well, well, there are still exchange rates there. Uh, it's just that those are substantially reduced, and you don't need a bunch of humans and middle management, management to monitoring this. And also, pre-funding is no longer required, which uh, reduces expenses as well. Um, next, uh, let's see here, payment settlement. Yeah, so uh, let, let's talk about payments and settlement real quick. In fact, if I could just highlight this, I, I wrote a blog. I actually started a blog. There's only one entry on it. And, um, and so here it is. I titled this, Who's Competing with Ripple? I wrote this, on Fe I published it on February 9th, 2018, over three years ago. And so like, so, and, and basically when I wrote this, this blog was everything that I wish that I had understood when I jumped into the world of crypto and started learning about Ripple and XRP in November of 2017. But I spent every single day after I, I jumped in, because I was just so engrossed in it, I was just hyper interested. I spent literally hours per day researching everything I could about Ripple and XRP to find out if it actually made sense uh, to... You know, just uh, the whole positioning of, of XRP as a bridge currency. I wanted to find out if, if it made sense or, off there, or if there was going to be, if there was some sort of Achilles heel that I was effectively unaware of. And so I threw every disaster scenario at the concept that I could. And uh, and I, I just, I couldn't break the idea. And and so you understand it. There was, like once upon a time, I was actually a blank slate. And when I jumped in learning about this, I didn't want something to be true or not be true. I just wanted the truth. And so I researched it and then I came to the conclusion. I was like, wow. And th this was my aha moment when I realized that cryptocurrencies would never go away. It's when I realized there are business models that can exist and that cannot exist without a technologically sufficient decentralized cryptocurrency that also has an open market price. And so I, I wrote this blog, which is pretty much everything that I wish I had been spoon fed when I jumped in and started learning about all of this. And so in terms of uh, payments and settlement, you need to understand that uh, th th these are very different things. You know, because you could consider, for instance, you know, if you make a payment with a credit card, uh, you, you might uh, you might consider that everything's done because from your perspective, what's complete? What else do you have to do? Well, there, there is more actually on the backside. Uh, you still have to pay your credit card company and then the credit card company still has to pay the vendor that you bought something from. So the moving of the money is the actual settlement where the payment happens when you're when you're like swiping the credit card. That's the actual payment, but the money hasn't moved. Nothing is actually settled. 
And and so similarly, there's in the world of cross border payments here, there's payments and settlement, and you must understand the difference between these two, or you're not going to understand how XRP is a solution. And so this why this is why with the case of Andre Jick, his his whole video, which I think was what close to 14, yeah, almost 14 minutes. Um, it became clear to me that he didn't understand the difference between payments and settlement. And this is core. If you don't understand this, you're not going to think that XRP is useful. There's no way. Um, and so here, here's what I wrote. Um, critics like to point out that Ripple solved the payments problem without any need for XRP. And so let me pause there. Uh, this is what Andre Drick did. And so I already saw people saying the same thing when I published this in February of 2018. XRP is not even needed. Well, okay. So again, I wrote, critics like to point out that Ripple solved the payments problem without any need for XRP. This is true, but such a comment is a red flag that the critics in question don't understand the purpose of XRP. The truth is that XRP was never intended to solve a payments problem. It exists to solve a liquidity problem. By the way, an another wor way to, to word that would be a uh, settlement. Um, and, and if I had to rewrite this, I mean, I, this this blog, frankly, uh, it still stands the test of time. There are little things I'd have to change, like XCurrent is now RippleNet, uh, XRapid is now known as on-demand liquidity. And I'd probably, instead of using the term liquidity, I'd probably use settlement at this point. Uh, but by and large, this thing stands. And so I then wrote, why is liquidity an issue? Um, and I could have easily, just as easily written settlement there. Uh, enter Nostro Vostro accounts. A Nostro account essentially references my money in your bank, while a Vostro account means your money in my bank. These accounts are what banks use today to source liquidity for cross-border payments. And at any given moment, more than $27 trillion is parked in these accounts in the form of every fiat currency you can imagine. XRP was designed as the solution to this liquidity nightmare. And I'll pause right there. This is one little thing where if I were to rewrite it now, because this is over three years old, I would have changed that. I wrote XRP was designed as the solution. And if I wrote it today, I would have written XRP was positioned as the solution to this liquidity nightmare. Um, this digital asset can be used as a replacement for all Nostro Vostro accounts. So to be clear, this means that one digital asset, XRP, eliminates the needs for banks to have multiple accounts in various fiat currencies all over the world. And so think about this. You don't, if you're a bank or a remittance company, you don't have to trust every single other bank or remittance company on the planet. You don't. All you have to do is have an account with cryptocurrency exchanges that are partnered with Ripple because the liquidity comes from the exchanges. And maybe there could be additional market makers in the future, but, but that's it. You don't need, the, so the, the trust issue is solved right there, but it can only happen with a decentralized cryptocurrency that has an open market price. It cannot be solved with a stable coin, a bank coin, or a central bank digital currency. And I'll, t I'll talk more about that in a minute, but um, that's this is absolutely crucial to, to understand. Uh, next bullet point here. Let's see, uh, Andre stated that uh, any coin can be used in place of XRP, uh, yeah, but he, here's the thing. That's I want to be clear of this. That's only true if Ripple allows it on their platform, All right? Let me take a sip of water. So, uh, and Brad Garlinghouse, Ripple CEO, has actually talked about this. <clears throat> um, no other coin beyond XRP has ever been used with an on-demand liquidity, which is what is the settlement portion of all of this. No other coin has. But uh, Brad Garlinghouse has, has publicly stated that if, if there are corridors where maybe, for instance, XRP is illiquid or there's regulatory issues for some reason with XRP and it can't transact, uh, you can use a different cryptocurrency in place of that. Now, even then, you'd have to pick one that's technologically sufficient. So Bitcoin wouldn't really be an example. It's too slow and the fees are too high. Uh, so that wouldn't happen. But you could, in place of that, use a different cryptocurrency. Now, it's unlikely this is going to happen. Uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that XRP being the largest holder, uh, I'm sorry, Ripple being the largest holder of XRP has every incentive in the world to continue to make sure that there's a healthy XRP ecosystem and continue to ensure that there's sufficient liquidity and that uh, that it, it's, because, well, for that reason, frankly, that's the reason that it's at the core of on-demand liquidity. They, they're incentivized via their large holdings to utilize it. And it's perfectly, it really is perfectly positioned for this use case anyway. Um, so yeah, they could, but but here's the thing. Like also understand, 
a third party can't just come in and plug a different coin in to Ripple's proprietary software because Ripple's RippleNet and on-demand liquidity that is proprietary. XRP is open source, permissionless, is not proprietary to Ripple. And so you can't just come in as a third party and plop another coin onto Ripple's proprietary software, which they control. That cannot happen. Um, and so if Ripple wants to do it, fine, but they're still, they, again, they have every incentive to make sure there's a healthy XRP ecosystem. And so he was he was used, citing this as a negative, and like, look, you could just use any coin for this. I'm like, well, no, because you need, you need, to, you need to have, if really, if, if you're worried about another coin taking over this use case, um, displacing XRP, you would need to have a competitor that is sufficiently placing a decentralized cryptocurrency for that use case. And it doesn't exist. There is no, out of over 8,000 cryptocurrencies, there is no other cryptocurrency that is being positioned or being used today as a bridge currency. And this is used today in enterprise-grade software. And so I'd say to Andre, he's probably never going to see this, but um, you, you know, you might ask yourself, and I'm not sure if he's aware of this because it wasn't cited in his video, Ripple has dozens of customers that today are they're paying customers utilizing XRP as a bridge currency via on-demand liquidity today. And so if he thinks that XRP and on-demand liquidity are not useful, then he better go ahead and convince Ripple's customers that are paying to use it. Uh, he better go over there and explain to them why it's not actually helping them when they think that it is. <laughs> now, obviously, obviously it is helping them or they would not be utilizing it. Uh, next bullet point here. He stated that XRP is very centralized because it's owned by a company. Uh, this is blatantly untrue. Uh, XRP is decentralized. Ripple has no special permissions um, over the, the XRP ledger or XRP itself. Um, because, you know, in order for that to, to occur, you'd have to have a system where, where that utilizes something like proof of stake, for example. Uh, then you could make that argument, but there's no such thing. So there's no proof of work. There's no proof of stake within this. In fact, all XRP was created at inception. So there, there was no mining at all. It just exists. It's out in the wild. And there's nothing in the code that says if you own this quantity of XRP or this percentage of XRP out of the total pool of XRP in existence that you now have special permissions does not exist. Um, in fact, uh, Ripple, in terms of, of, of uh, validating nodes that um, have their own UNLs, a unique node list. Um, and I don't want to get too much into the techie stuff. I'm happy to talk about it, though. Uh, but Ripple controls 16% of those. You know, and if you're talking about total nodes on the whole XRP ledger, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling from memory here, admittedly, but it, it might be like two or three percent total. So again, they have absolutely no special permissions whatsoever. XRP is absolutely decentralized. Um, and then I made another note here. Um, here we go. Mostly correct on his statement about what's happening with the... Yeah, okay, so he was talking a little bit about what's happening with Ripple and XRP. There are a few little things where I would have at a minimum worded it differently, but um, I'll go ahead and give him a pass on, on that. Um, so mostly good there. Uh, next, he said, quote, XRP has always been a crypto for the banks, end quote. But that's not true. Um, as I cited a, a little bit earlier, uh, it's just a better version of Bitcoin, uh, he says the appeal of Bitcoin, though, has has been that it's it's a hedge against inflation and the banks. That's what he says. Bitcoin, and, and I understand that that argument actually. That that does make sense. Uh, a lot of people, I think, do purchase cryptocurrency, Bitcoin specifically, as a hedge against tumultuous times. We would all agree, I think, that the United States dollar is being printed into oblivion. And so, yeah, that 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 is certainly true. But he says that this makes XRP a quote hedge against the hedge end quote. Uh, because what he stated is that XRP is not permissionless, not decentralized, or immutable. He says that XRP is centralized. And so on the permissionless portion, I already just talked about that. Uh, there, Ripple has no special permissions. There is no central point of failure. It is decentralized. On transactions, uh, they're 100% immutable. You cannot roll them back. Now, with Bitcoin, if there's a 51% attack, you can actually have a chain reorganization. And so we say that Bitcoin's transactions are immutable, but you actually can roll them back. Uh, with, with the XRP ledger, there is no such thing as a 51% attack. Um, and then he said, uh, Ripple picks the unique node, uh, the UNL. Yeah, the unique node list. So um, here, here's the thing. A decentralized system is only decentralized insofar as the participants within the system have agreed on the rules and that's why they're, they're participating, right? And so um, Ripple, in the beginning, 
they they created a list and i can't remember how many are on the list maybe like 10 i, I could be mistaken on that admittedly but uh, they're a list of of 10 validator nodes that uh, that are like that ripple they believe as as one part of the xrp ecosystem xrp ledger uh believes they're trustworthy and so there are other validators though out there that have their own lists and sometimes there's there's overlap now if there were no overlap then you wouldn't be able to communicate within the system this does not make it decentralized let me give you an example for let's compare it to the bitcoin blockchain you could go ahead and spin up a node on the bitcoin blockchain and make it state that you have one trillion bitcoin you could you could do that now nobody's going to listen to you right so you can do it but uh, but the, the, if you're doing that, you're just clearly being a mischievous jerk, right? And so it, 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 what I'm saying is true of the, of the XRP ledger is true of the Bitcoin blockchain also. It's only decentralized insofar as we're agreeing to, uh, to operate within this system that has clearly defined rules. That's it, right? And so Ripple having uh, listing nodes that, uh, that they trust and other validators listing nodes that they trust as long as there's sufficient amount of overlap and, and that's coded in actually, then you can make forward progress on the XRP ledger. If you've got somebody that's just being a jerk and not listening to anybody, well, nobody's going to listen to them. Just like if you're trying to spin up a node that says you have a trillion Bitcoin, nobody's going to listen to you. Now, if everybody listened to you and agreed, then it would then be true and that would be the case. That's the nature of decentralized systems. And so citing that the the, the fact that their Ripple has a UNL, that that is a very poor argument, and I think it speaks to the degree to which there's a misunderstanding of what it means to be decentralized uh, as a cryptocurrency. Uh, next bullet point: He stated that banks never adopted XRP because they don't want to take on the counterparty risk, uh, and so he's incorrect. He incorrectly believes that XRP is centralized. There is no counterparty risk, and as, as it, 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 now part of this is true. As far as he, him stating that XR, banks have not adopted XRP, well. In part, that's true. Um, banks are very risk averse. Um, so it's easy to see why all of Ripple's on-demand liquidity customers, which again, on-demand liquidity utilizes XRP, all the customers to this point, <coughs> excuse me, they have been remittance firms. Now they do have bank customers that are using the messaging portion, which is Ripple, that they have tons of banks that are utilizing that. As far as settlement to utilize an XRP, there are none. And there are a couple reasons for this. Uh, not the least of which is that uh, there's regulatory uncertainty throughout, well, let's just say most of the world. And so it's not surprising that uh, remittance companies are, are moving first. But the remittance firms they, that are using this in the corridors where it's available, they have tremendous advantage over uh, anybody operating, any competitor operating in the same corridor that isn't utilizing XRP, they have a tremendous advantage. And so ultimately what's going to happen is banks are going to either be forced to adopt this or their competitors are going to get the bank's business because the banks won't be able to, to, to compete on a cost basis. That's what will functionally happen in the end. And so, yes, it's true that today banks aren't utilizing XRP specifically. I don't, off the top of my head, I don't think there's even one. And so I'll acknowledge that, though. Like, I, I just want to speak whatever's true. And that is true. And it's a fair critique. But there, there's reasons for it, you know. Um, and, and also understand there's only a handful of corridors open right now because there's not sufficient liquidity to take over the SWIFT system right now. There are only a handful of corridors. Uh, frankly, you know, you're talking about this crypto asset class as a whole at its peak recently was only at $2.5 trillion with XRP being um, at this point, what I say, 30, 39 billion as I record this. Well, that's not enough. If you're talking about five or six trillion dollars in daily global flows, that, that, that's not enough. It's, it, there is not enough liquidity for XRP to solve this. So, and that's not a, a fault of Ripple. As the crypto space grows and XRP grows with it and it's adopted and increasingly traded, there will be more liquidity. And so if you have a su sufficient blend of price and liquidity, then you can have more transactions take place. But uh, that's just going to be a function of time primarily, right? Um, and so uh, banks will adopt it or they will stop or, or, if, they, or, if, or, if, uh, or if they don't they're going to lose all of the remittance business because they won't be able to compete on a cost basis. So it's one or the other. Either they adopt or if they don't, okay, fine. Then they lose the business. Either way, that business is going somewhere and XRP is going to have its uh, have its uh, piece in the whole process it, it, because there is no other solution. The, the, humans have not devised another solution for this. All right. Um, next year. Um, oh, he also stated that XRP was too volatile and that's why uh, banks would never want to use it. So I want to highlight this. That's absolutely factually inaccurate. Um, here is 
uh, a Ripple Insights piece from October 31st, 2019. I'm not going to read it, but uh, you can look this up yourself. Here's the URL at the top of the screen. It's titled, Do the Math, XRP is one-tenth as volatile as fiat for cross-border transactions. And so basically, in a nutshell, as it turns out, um, even though XRP is more volatile than any fiat currency, once you factor in the amount of time it takes to process a transaction with, uh, with a fiat currency, because it could be days and days, that's actually uh, more risky than having a, uh, an extremely volatile asset that settles in three to five seconds. Because how much is the price of XRP gonna change in three to five seconds? Probably not very much, right? Probably not very much. It, it can change a bit, but that's why if you if you just factor in time and in the United States dollar, or put your fiat currency of choice, much more volatile. So I encourage you to read through this if you want this, any, any additional specifics, but in a nutshell, uh, that that is, is what's going on there. Um, next here. Um, he says that banks would rather use their own token or the dollar, um, and and <laughs> that that's a whole. Let me grab something. I printed up. Here we go. So there's um, there's this. This was written by Brad Garlinghouse. Uh, it's a little piece he wrote titled "The Case Against Bank Coins." And so th this is this is this is so key. You have to understand that the core issue w with settlement is trust. Because as I stated earlier, you may recall, I cited, hey, if you're a bank or remittance company, there's no way you're going to have a relationship with every other bank and every other remittance company on the planet. If you magically could trust them, if that if that trust issue weren't there, then yeah, you could just transact back and forth and, and you wouldn't need XRP there wouldn't, because there wouldn't be friction. But you can't trust everyone on the planet. And so instead, if you're a remittance company... Or a bank, if you're just tapping into liquidity on cryptocurrency exchanges, you have just solved for the trust issue, but you can't solve for the trust issue with a central bank digital currency or a, a, a bank coin or a stable coin. They all have the same fundamental problem. So no matter how technologically advanced they are, they don't solve for trust because somebody controls them. They're centralized. And that's why the decentralization of the XRP ledger is key to all of this working, period. And so check this out. Here's, here's what Brad Garlinghouse wrote in part in this piece. A bank-issued digital asset can only really efficiently settle between the banks who issued it. Then two scenarios can play out. Scenario one, all banks around the world put aside competitive and geopolitical differences, adopt the same digital asset, agree on its rules, and harmoniously govern its usage. Fat chance. Scenario two, the more likely scenario. Banks not in the issuing group issue their own digital assets with their own set of rules and governance. Exactly. And so we actually have seen this, this to some degree because um, there have been banks that have been uh, talking about creating, and there may be some implemented now. Um, I, don't, I, you know, I mean, who hasn't talked about it? Like you're talking about like City, Citibank, Goldman Sachs has talked about JP Morgan. They've all talked about bank coins. And, um, <clears throat> and so understand that a bank coin is if, 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 here's here's the thing so if a bank creates a, a coin if it's openly traded on markets and that that's where its price comes from uh then it could yeah then you're talking about something that could uh, depending i mean <clears throat> there's, there's more than one factor but it could be potentially centralized it depends on <clears throat> excuse me it's not just based on that though it's also based on do they have special permissions over the blockchain but um it, you know if you're talking about a cryptocurrency that actually does um, have an open market price, well, then it's not backed by anything. But if you're talking about a bank coin that is not traded on cryptocurrency exchanges, well, where does it get its price from then? Well, the answer is it's backed by, uh, by fiat currency. In fact, Brad wrote the following. Check this out. This is the second big problem with all this. He wrote, and this is a quote, uh, bank coins will be, I'm sorry, uh, Brad says the second big problem with bank coins is that they will, quote, be backed by a basket of currencies. Once backed by cash, it's no longer an asset. It's a liability. Trading liabilities then ultimately requires moving cash across borders, recreating today's system, but adding more friction. And mind you, he wrote this on August 24th, 2016, over a year before I even knew XRP existed. They were thinking through all these potential problems here. Um, and so... <laughs> If you're talking about using a, uh, a bank coin instead of XRP, you must understand that you're just talking about a new form of, of digital currency. And so, you know, 
the, the United States dollar, pick, pick your fiat currency. They're already digital. They're just not utilizing blockchain technology. They're already digital. So if you take the same currency and then you have it represented on a blockchain platform, it's the, the underlying monetary policy is still in place. It changes nothing. So whether it's a central bank digital currency or, or, or a bank coin, it doesn't matter. So again, it's value, it's, it's price. It comes from whatever the underlying uh, asset is. And, and so again, you're not solving for trust there either. Again, I keep going back to there's, there's, there's pain points, there's payments and there's settlement. XRP can solve the settlement problem, but in order to solve the settlement problem, you must solve the trust problem. If you're talking about a bank coin that's, uh, that's backed by the holdings of a bank, well, how the hell are you gonna get you know, over 11,000 banks on the planet to just trust that? You're not solving for trust. And so if you're not functionally understanding that trust is at the core of this, then of course you don't understand XRP's use case. And of course you think that um, it was just a funding mechanism for Ripple. And it was a funding mechanism. It, it continues to be a funding me mechanism for Ripple. But that's not all that it is. It also is at the core of Ripple's entire business model. Full stop. Um, let's see. I think I might have another bullet point here. It says... Uh, oh, actually, about the last one here. Let's see. Uh, he stated that Ripple's success is independent of the success of XRP. Uh, right, but so this is not, not entirely true. So while XRP and Ripple are separate, the special sauce of on-demand liquidity requires XRP to be adopted. Otherwise, there's not as much of an incentive to switch from Swift GPI. Because functionally, Swift GPI... And uh, Swift GPI and, and RippleNet, which is the messaging port, those are messaging platforms, right? Neither of those specifically have to do with settlement. Those are both messaging platforms. Without XRP and on-demand liquidity, which that's the special sauce, what's the, what's the incentive to switch? I mean, th there may be nuances, like little details here and there that even I'm aware of within the platforms that could make one slightly better over the other. But uh, if it's only marginally better, why are you going to go to a complete new system? Like, the reason that the, the banks and remittance companies are switching to RippleNet and have, and there's hundreds of them that have, is you, you want to have that. You, it's good to have another option. First of all, fine. So, but that doesn't mean it's going to ever get get used. The reason it's getting used um, is because, well, first of all, so a lot of the, the entities that switched first, they, they started using it before Swift GPI came out. And then on top of that, there is no solution with Swift for settlement. You have to go through the legacy financial system. You're talking Nostra Bostra accounts. That's it. That's it. There is no other solution for settlement. So um, it's it's either XRP or you, you stick with what the, the legacy financial system is. Because again, there is no other. There, look, there are firms out there that have payments solutions. There are a number of them, and I've talked about them on this channel. There is only one company on the planet that is utilizing a cryptocurrency that's decentralized to fix the problem. And that is the only other solution that humans have devised to this point. So if something comes out of left field, fine, happy to talk about it. But uh, I, I simply do not see that here. So again, um, Andre, what he's entitled to his opinion, and again, it's absolutely nothing against him, but uh, he just cited so many facts that were so wrong. And this this is one of the longest videos I've now ever made. When I started recording, I figured it might be long. Uh, you never know for sure when you start recording how long it's going to go, but I just wanted to get everything out there. So now it's unpacked. And so um, if you guys would consider hitting a, a thumbs up on this, if, if you got anything out of this, um, I'd appreciate it because my video, my gosh, I mean, yeah, I've got 115,000 subscribers that are not at the time of recording this, but he's got almost 1.6 million. So um, I'm glad that I have this platform <laughs> I know, to, to, uh, to talk about this stuff when, when there are misstatements like this. But if you could help and just you know, share it on social media, something like that, or just even just hitting a thumbs up and leaving a comment, that'll help with the YouTube algorithm to uh, make sure that gets picked up. Because frankly, the fact that this video is so long, I think it means that uh, fewer people are going to click on it than usual. But hey, uh, this is what it took to cover this. And so uh, there, there we are. So again, nothing against Andre. I just think that he's wrong. And, um, and I know that he stated a bunch of things that absolutely are not in line with reality. So just wanted to set the record straight, but nothing personal whatsoever. Now, if you guys have any additional thoughts, anything to add, you think I missed something, would love to hear from you also in the comment section below. But uh, I will go ahead and wrap up here. I am not a financial advisor. Do not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon, Nambo.